Well, good morning, Legacy. Hallelujah. No more sad songs. No more bad days. We're faith people, amen. We sing the songs of faith, the songs of heaven, always rejoicing in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice, amen, amen. Well, it's so good to have you in church with us this morning. Are you guys happy to be here this morning? Oh yeah, it's so good, it's so good. If it's your first time with us here at Legacy, will you please raise your hand? We'd like to welcome you and love on you this morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, welcome to church. It's so good to have you. Such a blessing to have you for the first time. If you're watching online, we'd like to welcome you too. We love everybody watching online, all our partners and our friends. And um, if it's your first time, if you'll leave your hand lifted and fill out this Connect card for us, um, we'd like you to fill that out and take it to this room right outside the sanctuary after church. And if you'll do that for us, we'd like to give you a free gift so you don't want to miss out on it. We're so happy to have you here with us. Um, we just have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, anybody getting excited about the Family Faith Conference coming up? Wednesday through Friday, May 18th through 20th in the evenings at 7 p.m. with our special guest, Brother Keith Moore. And the website and the registration for the event is live. So if you will go on and log on and register for the event, we'll, we would appreciate that because it will help us know exactly how many are coming. Who's coming to the event? Can you raise your hand? You're going to be here. You're not going to let the devil stop you from being here that week, right? You're going to get all that God wants you to get. Amen. Amen. Okay. Some of you guys are just so happy to be here this morning. Some of you guys are so sleepy. Yeah. Yeah, but some of you are happy and and man, you know what? You know what helps is when we all join in together and go for God together. It's one thing if I'm going for him. It's one thing if a few of you are going for them, but what if we all, everybody in here got excited about God this morning? Huh? Okay, let me see you. Okay, any, any, I would make you, I was thinking I can make you all do the wave across the room. I won't make you do that. Okay, they started it, but. Also, please join us if you have it in your heart to come and pray with us this Wednesday night from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. We're gonna be praying about the conference and we've already had such amazing times of prayer these last couple weeks, so please join us for that. Um, I have just a few glory stories this morning and, they, well, I have so many. I have to pick just a few to tell you, but um, this morning I'll just share a few. Um, this one says, on Friday evening, I was assembling a wire storage cube shelf for our kids' playroom. One of the wire slides slipped and hurt, I hurt my pinky finger. I looked at, down at it because I immediately knew something was wrong and I could not move it. It was already starting to bruise and swell and each of my knuckles were facing in the opposite directions. Ouch. Come on, you legacy people, stop hurting yourselves, right? Okay. If you were here the last few weeks, you'd know what I was talking about. My pinky was seriously messed up, and I called my husband, and I told him I had either broken or dislocated my finger, and I needed to go to urgent care. He came home so he could stay with our kids while I went to get an x-ray. I really did not want to leave the kids or spend tons of money on something so silly, so I was hesitant to go to urgent care. As my husband was trying to convince me to go and get it taken care of, I looked at my pinky again and I saw that it was completely straightened out and all the pain had instantly left. I had full mobility in my pinky and my knuckles were straightened out and all the bruising and the swelling and the pain were gone. I am praising God. Isn't that good? <laughs> Only with God. This one says, I'd like to share a glory story about how God has provided for me to visit my, my mother for Mother's Day. In mid-February of this year, I expressed my desire to God to be with my mom for Mother's Day of this year, and almost immediately, he told me to believe him for the money to get a plane ticket. So I thanked him for, for providing the money and for my plane ticket. Six days later, I was talking with a friend who lives in my hometown, and he asked me when I was planning to come back that way. And I told him I had just looked at plane tickets a few days earlier, 
because I wanted to see my mom for Mother's Day. And that's all I said about it. After we got off the phone, he texted me and told me that he wanted to purchase my plane ticket, and he did, praise God. But little did I know that God wasn't done. This past Sunday, a member of Legacy Church family sewed $500 into my life for my trip. I was so blown away. She says, our God is so faithful and he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or we think. That is so good. This one is um, from someone on our welcome team. And she says that the Lord has restored one of her friendships that had had gotten off. And she's so thankful to the Lord. And she said, I'm so grateful that this relationship is restored. And it's all started with my restoration of my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to share this testimony with you and thank you. Thank you because you put great importance and emphasis on knowing the word and having a relationship with God. And I wanted to testify that he is alive in the hearts of the congregation at Legacy Church. Thank you for reading the glory stories every week. It's constantly reminding me to remember him and recall what he's done in my life. And there is always something that I can be thankful for. Isn't that so good? And this is the last one for today. Um, I drove with my daughter in love. I like that when people do that. Daughter in love. My daughter in love and my three grandchildren to pick up my son from the hotel um, at the Denver airport. Before we started, I declared, let us go to the hotel, pick up your daddy and return safely. Those are some good words, right? I also put the angels in front, back, sides, top, and bottom to guard and protect us, and I also applied the blood of Jesus. We were going on I-25, going about 65 miles per hour because we were in a work zone. I was in the left lane when a work truck started from a standstill in the express lane and came over into my lane. A A semi was in the middle lane, and I had nowhere to go. It seemed as if I was being coached stay, 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 go. And as I angled over, the work truck was angling with me just inches away. It didn't touch the vehicle. It was like there was a bubble wrap in between us and we were in the middle lane. My daughter-in-law said later that it, if, if it My daughter-in-law said later that it was as if something had pushed the semi forward so that there was a place for us in the middle. We praise God for the angels and Jesus' blood, and we were not even touched, and we give God all the glory. Isn't this awesome? Why don't you stand up and we're just gonna praise God for these things. Father, we wanna thank you this morning and rejoice with our brothers and sisters and in this church family of how you have taken such good care of them, how you've provided for all of us time and time again. We're so grateful and we're so thankful, Lord, that you have protected us all our life long. You have been faithful every step of the way and we don't take one thing for granted. We are thankful people, thankful to you and thankful and expecting that there are much greater things that are even yet to come. And we're expecting good things for you, that the goodness and your mercy would follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. We love you today, Lord, in Jesus' Praise name. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say it out loud. Our good God has done good things. He's doing great things. And greater things are yet to come. Do you believe what you've heard today that the Lord would do the same thing in your life? Do you believe the Lord would fix a pinky for you? Does he care about pinkies? Absolutely he does. He made them. Of course he cares about them. He cares about our protection. He cares about our provision. And what he's done for others, he is doing for us, especially when we rejoice with them. And that's what these testimonies are all about. It's about stirring faith on the inside of you, not so that you'd stand there and go, well, God never does that for me. No, that's not the right response. The right response is, man, God is good, and if he's done it for them, he'll do it for me. Father, again, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's offering time this morning. We're going to worship the Lord together with our giving today. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis chapter 26, and while you're looking for Genesis 26, I want to read to you, and we'll put this on the screen, from the book of Psalms, chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. So you're looking for Genesis 26, and while you're doing that, we'll look at Psalm 37, verse 1. Look on the screen. It says this, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. 
and wither as the, her the green herb. You know, you maybe have heard me say this before, but I'm going to remind you, you and I, as believers, must be very watchful over whose story we allow to inspire us. We all love a good story. We all love a story about a person who came from nothing and, and worked hard and succeeded, and now look at what they've got. Everybody loves that rags-to-riches story, that trial-to-triumph story, but you need to be very watchful over whose story really you let get in your heart, whose, whose life story you allow to inspire you. Because there's a lot of people that, yeah, maybe they've got some stuff, but you don't know how they got that. And you don't know whether or not they trusted the Lord for it. You don't know whether or not they sowed and believed God or whether they blessed other people. I mean, what if they cheated everybody? What if they lied? What if they stole? You want that story to inspire you? Not me. And this is, in essence, what he's saying here. Don't fret because of evil do doers. Don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. Man, we have a real temptation sometimes to face when we see people who, who we know are not living for God and we know very publicly not living for God. And you think, well, man, look at what they've got. And it really looks like they're prospering. And the scripture's telling you, don't be envious of that. And do not fret over evildoers. Don't worry about it. Why? He said, because they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. So here's what we do instead. Trust in the Lord and do good. Or you could say, trust in the Lord and do what's right. Notice this instruction. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. When you go back through scripture, particularly the Old Testament, starting with God's first covenant people, the land was a big deal to him. He went to great lengths, first to introduce himself to a man named Abram, who would later be called Abraham, and one of the first promises he made to this man had to do with the land that he was calling him to. The land that he would give to him and his descendants. The land that he would bless them with. The land that they would grow in. The land that they would thrive and flourish in. It was about the land. And one of the first things God said to this guy was, you're going to have to leave home. Why? Because this is not the land. You're in the wrong land. And you would think, well, God's God. He could bless you anywhere, right? Well, evidently not. Evidently, the land, the specific place and location that he's called you to has some kind of significance, has some importance. That's why he said, instead of, instead of being envious of all these other people, here's what you do instead. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Do what's right. Dwell in the land. What land? The land I've called you to. The land I have assigned you to live in, to dwell in. And this is what that word dwell means. It literally means to abide, to remain, to set, to settle down, or to continue. We might say to stay there. To dwell in a land means find out where God's called you and then what? Stay there. Stay there. And you see this, like I said, throughout Scripture. The, the, the other places in the Psalms talk to us about our wealthy place. There is a place wherein you will prosper, spirit, soul, and body. But you and I have got to find that place. Lord, where is that place? Where have you called me to? Where's our land? And when you find it, what are you supposed to do? Dwell in it. Now, if, if the land or the location is a big deal to God, and if the land has something to do with you thriving and has something to do with you prospering in every area of your life, guess what your enemy is at work doing right now? Tempting you to leave the land. Trying to get you out of the land. Look at how they're prospering in this land. Ooh, look at that land. And for some people, it's just the land on the other side of the fence. Just looking at what's over on that side. Just, just what's over here a little bit. But this is a big deal to God. Even to the point and the lengths that he went to to get the Israelite children out of the land of Egypt so that they could get into the promised land. And then they wandered around out there for 40 years. And finally, when Joshua came into leadership, what did the Lord tell him? He said, go 
and no man will stand before you all the days of your life and every place the sole of your foot will tread, I've given to you. And then he started creating boundaries for them. From, from this river to the going down of the sun over here, creating boundaries, this land. Joshua could have been like, well, God, I mean, can't you just bless us in this land? We're here. We don't got to pack. We don't got to move. We don't got to go anywhere. We're here. Can't you just bless us here? And what's the Lord saying? No, the blessing is there in that land. In Genesis chapter 26, look at verse 1. Genesis 26, 1 says, There was a famine, where? In the land. Besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, in Gerar. But verse 2 says, The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Don't go to Egypt. There's a famine in the land. This land's not producing anything. This land's not helping us eat. It's not providing. Let's go to Egypt, which is always represented throughout Scripture, the world and the world's system and the world's way of thinking and doing things. And the temptation is if this land is not producing, we got to find one that is. And so you see, as you read this, Isaac's facing a temptation to leave the land that God's called him to and go to a different one. But the Lord appeared to him and said, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. Live in the land that I'll tell you. Verse 3, dwell, remain, reside, set, settle down, continue, stay in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands. And I'll perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I'll make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven, and I'll give to your descendants all the lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Verse 6, so Isaac dwelt. He stayed in Gerar. He stayed in the land. It'd be better to be in a land where there's famine if God's saying, I'm with you here than to find some other land that looks like it's prospering and thriving and flourishing and everybody's eating. The Lord said, don't go over there because I'm with you in this land and I'll bless you in this land and I'll multiply you in this land. You go over there, you're left to bless yourself. You're left to try to multiply and increase yourself. In this land, I'll do it for you. So Isaac, very smartly, very wisely, stayed in Gerar. But he didn't just stay there. I want you to notice what else he did. Verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land. So he did two things when it came to the land. What did he do? Number one, he stayed there. Even when there was a temptation to leave there, even when there was a draw somewhere else, thinking I can provide better if I go over here, the Lord said, no, I'm with you here. So do what? Stay here. Stay. Isaac stayed there, but what else did he do? Did you notice this? Verse 12. Not only did he stay there, he sowed there. He sowed there. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. In the same year. In a land where there's famine. In a land and in a time you're not supposed to be able to reap. In a land and in a time where it makes no sense to sow, he stayed and he sowed and then what? He reaped. And not just reaped a little, he reaped a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Verse 13, are you ready for this? The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Now, for such a dirty word, it sure appears in this verse a lot of times. (laughs) The man began to prosper continued prospering until he became very prosperous. The message translation says he grew richer and richer by the day. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Wow. What happened in the land? Because he stayed there. The Lord said, I'll bless you here. But I, noticed, I want you to notice it wasn't just staying there. What else was it? Sowing there. So Isaac couldn't have been like, well, fine, I'll stay, but I'm not sowing. 
fine, you say stay, I'll stay, but I'm not sowing here. It makes no sense to sow here. It's all dried up here. He didn't do that though, did he? He stayed and he sowed. Now, this, this occurred to me in the last couple of weeks thinking about this. You know what Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be there. But think about it. Why do certain companies require a non-refundable deposit? Because they know you. They know us. They think, okay, we'll, we will require you to put a little bit down. And they know human nature so well to know that you ain't backing out of it. Because you've already got something in it. Come on, am I talking to anybody right now? You know exactly what I'm talking about. That thing might have cost you $3,000 and you put, you know, eighteen fifty dollars down and well, I can't back out now. You know, I got almost 20 bucks invested, invested in this thing. You know what happens. You put a little bit in it and that's why they do it. Because once you've got something in it, what's, what, what's the result? You're committed. You're committed. Why is, why is Isaac sowing in this land? Hey, I'm staying here. I can't leave here. I got something in it. Come on, listen to me. I got something sown in this thing. I'm not bailing on it now. I got something sown in it. Yeah, I know it looks like famine, but where am I going to go? I got everything I've got's invested here. He didn't just stay there. What did he do? He sowed there. He stayed and he sowed. And you hear us say this on a weekly basis. We believe God with you, church. And we are serious about this, that you would be in your right place at the right time time doing the right thing with the right people and we are so serious about that and we recognize this that that this land where you and I have come this church we know that this isn't everybody's church that would be silly to think that that'd be prideful to think that and what we want more than anything is for you to be in the right place and if this is it stay here and if this is it, so here. And if this is not it, let's go find it. Go find it. Because when you find the land that God has called you to be in, he will bless you there. He will increase you there. He will multiply the, you there. If you'll stay there and if you'll sow there. Stay and sow, right? Do you see what happened to Isaac? He began to prosper and then he continued prospering. And then he became very prosperous, and the man grew richer and richer by the day. Because he obeyed the Lord, found the place he was supposed to be, stayed there, and sowed there. And this has been a big deal to us for a long time. You know our story. We moved here from Fort Worth, Texas, where I was born and raised nearly 40 years. But we had something in our hearts that was calling us up here, and it's like, well, Lord, you know, church is church. Can't we just start it in Texas? Can't we just start it there? We don't have to move. We don't got to pack anything. We don't got to transfer anything. It's a lot cheaper. Didn't have anything to do with any of that. There was a land that he called us to. There was a place. And bless God, there was a people. A family that he called us to. And a family that we're staying in. And a family that we are sowing in. Amen? So find the land and then what? Stay there and so there. Glory to God. Now this morning, this is the first Sunday of the month. So today what we're doing is we're taking this entire offering today and we are putting it in the Family Faith Conference. So it's just a few days away and I'd love, guys, help me with this. I want to get us like a, a day counter or hour counter, something that shows us how close we're getting to the conference because it is getting here quick. But this morning what we're going to do is we're going to sew here. We're getting ready to host uh, Brother Keith. We're hosting not just our local church family, but partners from different places around the world, perhaps. We've invited them all, so we'll see who comes. But we're going to host them and love them and bless them and invest in this. If this is your land, then stay here and sow here. So everything this morning is going into the Family Faith Conference. And it's going into the improvements that we're making throughout uh, the sanctuary. You're, I believe you're going to start seeing some things take place in the lobby here over the next couple of weeks. So I know we've been talking about that. I think that banner's been hanging up there for about a year. 
and is ready to see some progress, glory to God, but uh, it's going to be good things that we see. So today, if you want to get involved in this offering, you don't have to designate it, you don't got to do anything, all of it is going into the conference, into the preparation, and of course, one of the things we're doing is we are setting aside um, uh, offering to bless Brother Keith and the ministry that's coming, so keep that in your heart as well. So if you've got something today you want to do and the Lord's leading you, just do it and know that uh, it's going into this conference and the preparation for it and everything that it takes to get ready for that. If you're giving by cash or credit card today, raise your hand. Our ushers have an envelope for you. We'll get one to you. If you're writing a check, you can make it payable to Legacy Church. And if you're watching online, you can visit us online at LegacyChurch.Family and all the giving instructions that you need will be there. And again, don't, don't be concerned about designating anything. It will all go into the conference. Sarah, would you come please and bring our offering? I'm staying here. Are you staying here? You good? I'm staying. I'm staying here. Thank you, Lord. Take your time and finish writing. And when you're done writing, just stand with us. Whether you're giving or not today, just stand and we'll worship the Lord together. This is one of our favorite things to do together as a family, as a body, is to honor the Lord with our increase. We honor Him, uh, and we wouldn't have anything to give if it weren't for Him. The only reason you or I or any of us have anything to put in this offering today is because He has blessed us. So let's hold this up before the Lord. Father, we honor you and worship you today with our giving. We ask you to see it and receive it from a heart of faith and a heart of love. And Father, we are so thankful that you have put us in a good land. This is a land that truly flows with milk and honey. This is a land that is thriving and prospering. I look around at what you're doing in this land, Father, as we listen to these glory stories, one right after another. This is just evidence that you are blessing this family in the land that you've called us to be in. We commit to you and to one another, Father, as long as you would keep us here and put us here, this is where we'll stay. This is where we will sow. And we expect to see the same good results that we see in your word that you cause us to prosper more and more, increase more and more, us and our children. And Sarah and I declare the blessing of the Lord over this congregation today. In Jesus' name, we call you blessed. We speak increase over your life, and we say that everything you set your hand to do in God prospers, and the windows of heaven are opened above you. A blessing is being poured out so much, so rich, so strong, there's not room enough to contain it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right, church, let's say this together. We are prospering in every area of our lives, spirit, soul, and body. Today we sow in faith and we reap in joy. We will have more than enough to meet every need, to pay every debt, and to be a big blessing to a lot of people. We're not running out. We're running over in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Let's just go ahead. Praise the Lord. Father, we love you and worship you. We thank you again for the good work you've begun in us. We call you faithful to finish it. You are the author, the finisher, the developer, and the perfecter of our faith. We thank you for it, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. This morning, what I want to do before we get into the Word and those of you who were with us last week, you may remember I played for you a clip from something Brother Keith had said at their church there in Faith Life. Uh, I believe that was from Sarasota. And I, I felt impressed with the Lord that you and I needed to be in preparation for this conference coming up, just getting a little taste each week of the ministry and the caliber of the ministry that we're going to be receiving from. And I felt like this would help uh, build some expectation in us. Uh, begin to expect to hear some good things, not just good things, but things that would change our lives, things that would give us direction, and just develop in us a real hunger for the Word of God. So, uh, Jason, help me out. Do we have that ready? Can we be ready to go with that? Here's what I want to do. Before we get into the Word this morning, I've pulled another clip that I want you to see, but this time, this is from Brother Keith standing on this platform a year ago. Now, uh, Sarah and I have been going back and watching this message, and we knew it was good then. And I've listened to it a time or two since then. But just in the last few days, last few weeks, it has been, I, I don't even have the words to say. 
It was as though every word was prophetic. It was as though every word was painting a picture of what this last year would be. It was so spot on. It was so right on. And if you have not gone back to hear it, I'm encouraging you, go hear the whole thing. And I believe, unless the Lord leads us a different way, uh, I want to take a few minutes in each of our Sundays between now and conference time to go back to this message and refresh ourselves on some of the things he said. I want you to listen to this today, and I want you to pay close attention to it because it has everything to do with where we've been, and it has everything to do with where we're going. So have a seat. Guys, when you're ready, you can play that video. I want you to notice in this verse again, 12.1 of Hebrews. 12.1 of Hebrews. He said, see, we got this great cloud of witnesses. Do what? Lay aside every what? Weight and sin, which does so easily beset and run with patience the race that is set before us. Here you will see three reasons. He gives them to us right here. Why people would stop running their race. Weights, sin, and impatience. Have we got time to talk about those three a little bit today? Because if you're, if you're aware of it, then you're forearmed. You're prepared. And you can see the enemy trying to get you out, trying to get you off. Weights. What are weights? Weights are not sins. And yet weights can cause you to give up your race. Just like sins can. Just like impatience can. What is a weight? Well, a weight is something that weighs you down. <laughs> Y'all are quiet. Yeah. <laughs> a weight is something that weighs you down. Well, that's particularly a problem if you're running a race. Right? If you're running an endurance race and somebody said, here, take this. <laughs> What is that? Backpack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and somebody comes by and says, here, you should take this too on your race. What is it? I'll just put it in the back here. It's a brick. <laughs> and here's three cans of beans. You might get hungry along the way. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a hammer and some tools in case you come across something you need to bring. Now, now you're laughing. But we use this term all, all the time. You know, they, they got a lot of baggage. Huh? Carrying a lot of baggage. We don't mean physical suitcases. What are we talking about? What, what, what is baggage? Anything that weighs you down is going to wear you out. And you get fatigued enough in, in, in running your race, you get fatigued enough, it gets harder every day to go on. And what you don't realize is you're getting up, you're getting up out of bed in the morning and you're reaching over and putting on your 20-pound boots with the lead heels. <laughs> and you're putting on your 50-pound, you know, uh, uh, baggage around your waist and you're putting on your 100-pound, and, and you, you don't even recognize you're doing it because you've been doing it for the last 20 years. cares about this, upset about the past, 
Hmm? When the Lord says, cast, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. What does all mean? Come on, help me out. What, is, what does all mean? We, we so need to be honest with ourselves about anything we're carrying. That we still, it still hurts us. It still bothers us. It still, uh, you know, weighs on us. Did you hear the terminology? That's exactly how we talk about it because that's exactly what's going on in the spirit. It's, you don't have to carry pains from the past. There's a term I really don't care for that's popular in the modern church. We're all just broken people. You ever heard anything along this line? Well, we're all just broken people. Why do we have to be broken people? Well, every, everybody's, you know, got things from their past and hurts and pains. Sure, but why can't you be healed? Why can't you get over it? Why do you have to be scarred emotionally your whole life? The Lord can't heal it. He can't fix it. Why do you have to carry that? And why was he broken? So we could be broken? No. He was broken so we could be whole. Can he heal anything? Can he heal anything? If you'll let him. If you'll let him. Years ago, I went to, Phyllis and I went to visit some friends and they had a little, uh, beautiful little girl about, I don't know, four years old, I guess or so. And she came running over and said, hug me, hey, Brother Keith, Brother Keith. And, and right after that, she wanted to show me that she had a, an owie. She had scraped her knee somehow. And, and, and so she pops it up in my face. I'm sitting on the couch. And, and tells me how bad her fall was. And then her mom had did a beautiful job of bandaging it up. She reaches and takes the bandage and rips it off with what healing had occurred for the last couple of days to show me how bad it was. And I tried to stop her, but kids are quick. And I, I, said, I tried to say, no, 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 it's already off. And, and I'm laughing at the same time. And, and the Lord said, pay attention, pay attention. I thought, okay, what's what? He said, this is how so many of my people do. Something starts to heal and they tear off the bandage and they want to tell everybody how bad it was and relive it and retell it so you start over. How many understand you've got to pour in the oil and wine and then leave it alone? You've got to quit talking about it. You've got to quit bringing it up. You, you've got to forgive and let it go. Come on, are y'all with me? And if you'll do that, it will heal up. And after a few days, it won't hurt as much. And after a few weeks, not nearly as much. And after a month or two, you had not thought about it for a whole week. Come on, can you see this? And you'll get to the place where you are completely healed. It is not hindering you. It is not weighing on you. Say it out loud, I don't have to carry pains from the past. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you say that one more time? I don't have to carry pains from the past. Father, we open your word today. And as we do, we open our eyes and our ears to see and to hear, to receive from you answers. 
We thank you, Lord, for doing something in us today that, that changes and marks our lives forever. Lord, we are so thankful and excited about the days that are in front of us, this time that we've set aside in our conference to, to gather together and hear from you, not to hear from a man, not to hear from anybody but you and your word through your Holy Spirit. So we ask right now, Lord, that what we dig in today would be preparation for that. It would get us ready. Thank you for the healing power that's at work in our lives and that's at work in this church today. We give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Colossians chapter 2. This has to do with what we just heard. Colossians chapter 2. Let me read a few verses to you again. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, watch out, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Say it out loud. I am complete in him. You are just as complete as Jesus. That's why he put these two things together. In Jesus dwells all the Godhead bodily. There's nothing in God that's left out of Jesus. And you, if you're in him, are just as complete as he is. Glory to God. You're not, just like what Brother Keith said, you know, this, this, this common conception that people have and talk and preach that we're all just broken. Well, if you're broken, then you're not complete. If you're broken and you're in pieces, you are incomplete. See, there's so much tradition and religion and stuff that people just make up. And you, you can get a whole room full of people to go, oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm, good. Amen. Well, what's the Bible say about it? Come on, you got to give me the word on this. I got to have the word. I'm not looking for somebody's opinion. I'm not looking for somebody's tradition or what everybody else seems to agree on. I want to know what the Bible says. And if the Bible says I'm complete in him, then that means I'm not broken into a million pieces. I'm complete in him. You are complete in him. Now, as we've talked about this over the last eight or nine weeks now, what we're beginning to discover is that this has to do with our identity. Somebody say identity. identity. And there is a crisis on right now in this world, and it is an identity crisis. People don't know who they are. Many people don't know what they are. Many people are asking, wondering, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And it sounds like a really deep philosophical question, but I'm here to tell you this morning, it's a waste of time. Quit asking, who am I, who am I, who am I? And start finding out who you are in him. Who are you in Christ? Who are you in Jesus? Who is Jesus in you? That is a much more worthwhile question than who am I, who am I? Who cares who you are? Who cares who I am? And yet people are so wrapped up in identity, identity and identifying with all these different things. People identify and get their identity from the family they were born in or their identity comes from the nationality that they were born into or their identity comes uh, from their education or from the money that they have or from the car that they drive or the clothes that they wear. A lot of people now find their identity their entire lives wrapped up in the political party they support. And for many people, and sadly many Christians, all those identities come before the identity in Christ. For many people, they are an American Christian. Many people are a Republican Christian. Well, what's wrong with that? That's not our identity. Your identity is not a Republican or a Democrat who is a Christian. 
Your identity is a believer, a Christian, one who is blood bought, washed in the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost. And anything and everything else you are comes way after that. Amen? So to be complete in him is to not look to anything or anyone else to provide you with your identity. It is to look to Jesus and say, my identity is in him. And what he is and who he is in me. So that's what we've been talking about. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we got into something from the book of John chapter 5. And I want you to turn back there with me. John chapter 5. And this is something I've not been able to let go of. This has been the topic of conversation around our house. Sarah and I have talked and preached to each other about this for days and weeks on end now. And I want to get back to it. If you think back with me on Resurrection Sunday, that was a couple of weeks ago. We dealt with some of these things and how we identify. But the Lord said something to me in preparation for that Sunday that I forgot to mention to you. But he said to me, and reminded me of what the Bible said in the book of John chapter 3 after Jesus had turned the water into wine. The Bible said that that was the beginning of miracles. And as I was getting ready for that Resurrection Sunday... I felt like that's what the Spirit of God was saying to me about us in this church on that day, that it was the beginning of miracles. And we talk quite a bit about not identifying as somebody who's weak, not identifying as somebody who's sick, but identifying because you identify as crucified with Jesus, buried with Jesus, risen again with Jesus, seated with Jesus in heavenly places. If those things are your identity, then you are not identifying as the weak. You are identifying as the strong, the ones getting stronger and stronger and stronger, not weaker, weaker, weaker. And you see some of that here in John chapter 5. I want to read this to you again, but I'm going to read it to you from the King James Bible. Normally I read from the New King James but I want you to hear this from the King James translation. And there's one word that keeps showing up verse after verse. And I want you to pay attention and see if you can find it. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. King James Bible. We'll put this on the screen. It says, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent, or that means weak or sick people, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole. Was made what? Whole. Was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity, a weakness, a sickness, 30 and 8 years. 38 years this man's been weak. When Jesus, verse 6, saw him, he knew he had been now a long time in that case. He said to him, wilt thou be made, what? Whole. Do you want to be made whole? What are we talking about? What are we? We are complete in him. Do you want to be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was, say it with me, made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them and said, he that made me whole, the same said to me, take up thy bed and walk. They asked him then, what man is this that said to you, take up your bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not. He didn't know who it was for Jesus had conveyed himself away. He'd walked away. A multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus, finding him in the temple, said to him, Behold, look, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto you. Verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had, say it with me, church, made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, sought to slay him, 
because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Did you notice what kept coming up verse after verse? I know we're talking about the healing of, a, of an individual, but notice the word that the scripture uses to talk about what it means to be healed. He said the man was made whole. Every time the angel would come and trouble the water, the first one into the water would be made whole. Does that sound like something else we've been talking about? To be whole is to be complete. It means that nothing, listen to me, nothing is missing. There's not a missing piece. There's not a missing chunk out of you somewhere. You're complete. You've been made whole. That angel comes, troubles the water, first one in, made whole. Jesus sees a man who's been sick, finds out, we, we find out he's been this way 38 years, and Jesus says to him, do you want to be made complete? Do you want to be made whole? Now, I'm going to take just a minute and talk about this because, again, we mentioned it before, but this is an interesting question, and it almost sounds like a rhetorical question, like why even ask the man? And we know that Jesus is operating here with, with some form of a, a word of knowledge. He can see that this man's been in this case. He's been this way a long time. And if Jesus is going to do whatever Jesus wants to do, then why doesn't he just go up to him, skip the whole formality of what do you want, and just say to him, rise, take up your mat and walk. But there's not one wasted word out of the mouth of Jesus. So when he came to him, he asked him this question. Do you want to be made, say it again, whole. whole? Do you want to be complete? Now that ought to tell you right there what sickness is. What is sickness? It's really not what sickness is. It's not what, what's present. It's not the disease that's present. It's the strength that's absent. Listen to me now. It's not, it's not the symptom that's present. It's the strength that's missing to fight it off. So when, when Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? He's identifying, you're missing something, man. You are in a bad way because you are not complete. And that's what sickness is. It's an incompleteness. There is strength that you are lacking to fight that. There is something on the inside that you need that you don't have to fight this trash off. And so Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to be complete? I notice you're missing something. I see you are incomplete. Do you want to be complete? Wilt thou, he said in the King James, be made whole? The uh, New King James, how did he say it to him in verse 6? Do you want to be made well? Listen to it from the Amplified, the Classic Bible. It says, when Jesus noticed him lying there helpless... Knowing that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, listen, do you want to become well? Now look at what the Amplified adds. Are you really in earnest about getting well? Are you really in earnest about getting well? What does in earnest mean? Look it up. It literally means this, serious. What's Jesus saying? It's not just a, a question of whether or not the guy wants to, Jesus is trying to get to the bottom of it here. Are you serious? Do you want to be made well? Are you serious about being made well? Doesn't that seem like a strange question? And yet Jesus is asking it. Are you serious? Are you serious about being made well? Are you serious about being whole? Are you serious about being complete? If Jesus asked it that day, do you think he would ask it today? Do you think Jesus would ask anybody in this room or anybody watching online right now? Would, any, would Jesus ask any of us, do you want to be made well? And we said, well, yeah, Jesus, we do. And he says, no, no, no. Are you serious about it? Are you serious about being made well? And again, notice the guy's response in verse 7, which still... Weeks after preaching this to you for the first time, it's still making me laugh because it should have been the shortest verse in the Bible. Do you want to be made well? Verse 7, yeah. <laughs> that should have been it, right? But instead, what does he say? Verse 7, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man. I don't have anybody. 
I don't have anybody to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. For while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Somebody else's fault that he's not well. It's somebody else's fault that he's not whole. It's somebody else's fault that he's not complete. That was not the question. The question wasn't, why aren't you well? The question was, do you want to be? And are you serious about being well? And I want you to notice the human nature, the nature of the flesh, to almost instinctively go into blaming other people for your incompleteness. Blaming other people for why you're not whole, for why you're not well, for why you're not healed. And what was Jesus' question? Are you, are you ready to get serious? Are you ready to get serious about being well, about being whole, about living complete? And if Jesus is asking us this, that question this morning, which is different, by the way, than him asking this guy. This man has no idea who this is. When Jesus came and said, do you want to be made well? This guy had no idea that this man was the, the fullness of the Godhead bodily and that the power dwelt within him and that the willingness to heal was present. All he knows is some guy's asking him a question. He doesn't know who Jesus is. What's your excuse? What's my excuse? Do you know who Jesus is? If you don't, there's a room full of four and five-year-olds down at the end of the hall who would be happy to tell you who he is. I know who he is. And when he says to me and when he says to you, do you want to be made well? Are you serious about being complete and whole? There is no misunderstanding. I know who I'm looking at. I know who's talking to me. It's the one with the power to do it. It's the one with the willingness to do it. So when he says to you, are you serious about being made well? If the answer is yes, then step one has got to be stop blaming other people. Stop blaming other people for you not being whole, for you not being complete, for you and I not being made well. You want to get serious about being well? Let's stop blaming other people. Now, again, I want to remind you this, that the Bible gave us this detail about this guy's life. He's been in this condition. How long? 38 years. 38 years. Now, if you keep reading about this man, the, the Pharisees... They're trying to get to the bottom of what happened and they go talk to his parents and, and, and say, who did this to him? Who made this man walk on the Sabbath? And they said, ask him. And one of the details they brought out was he's over 40 years old. He's over 40. Now, we don't know how much over 40, but I think it would be easy and safe to say that this man has been in this condition most of his life. 38 years out of his 40 plus. He's been weak. 38 years he's been incapacitated. 38 years he's been a cripple. 38 years he's had to beg other people. 38 years he has seen himself this way. And when something has been a part of your life for that long, watch out because it becomes part of the identity. When you've been dealing with something For that long, it becomes part of your identity. How do you know when a sickness or a disease or a weakness has become part of your identity? It is when that thing spills over into every other area of your life. It's when when every relationship you have is viewed through the lens of that weakness. It's when financially your whole life is built around that weakness. When that weakness, whether it's physical, whether it's mental or emotional, in your soul, or in your body, when that thing becomes so pervasive and spills over and affects every area of your life, relationally, financially, spiritually, you know that it has become part of your identity. And if that is part of your identity, if you identify in what you don't have, You are not complete. You are missing pieces. You are missing big chunks of life and who you are. And I guarantee you this. 
after 38 years of dealing with this thing, it's this man's identity. It's who he is. And he's not the only one. You see in other places throughout Scripture, people whose sickness and their weakness has affected every other part of their lives. I'm thinking about Mark chapter, is it two, I think, where it talks about the man who was paralyzed. He was born by four, the man born by four, the man who was carried by his four friends. Do you remember what happened that day? Jesus was in a house preaching. And I don't know, but maybe word started traveling around town that the healer is here. So here's this man that's been paralyzed for we don't know how long and who is dependent on these four guys to get him anywhere he needs to go. He cannot get himself there. Do you see how a sickness, his personal physical weakness, is now spilling over into relationships? So dependent on these other guys. And as much as maybe they love him, they got their own lives to live. Come on, help me out, church. These guys, they may love him, but this is not convenient. This is not helping them. His weakness and what he now identifies with spills over into relationships, which is why, in my mind, when these four guys heard that Jesus was in town, they were like, bro, you going. <laughs> now, we have no indicator that he wanted to go. We have no indicator that he wanted to do anything other than lay on the couch and let them bring him sandwiches and let them take care of his needs. Hey, hey, so glad you're home. Um, I'm thirsty. Could I, try, could I trouble you for a, a glass of water? I would get it, but, you know. No, brother. No, man. Just, of course, love you. I'm happy to do it. How long has this gone on? I don't know. So when Jesus is in town... The four dudes look at each other and like, you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> Absolutely. They pick that guy up, haul him to wherever Jesus is. But you remember what happened. They get there and there's no room. You can't even get in the door. It's so packed. So the guy on the mat's like, oh, <laughs> maybe we should just go home. Maybe we'll go home. I'm sure he'll be to town again sometime soon. And the guys are like, no. Uh uh. And they're looking around, can't get in there. And finally, one guy spots this staircase going up the side of the house to the roof and looks over at his friend. And they give each other this look like, I'm going up. So the two of them run up the stairs, the other two are dragging that guy up the stairs. Why? Because you're walking home today, son. I love you. You know, I'm your friend, I'm here to help, but I'm done. Do you see what I'm saying to you, though? When somebody's weakness, spills over, and it's not just a physical thing anymore. Now it's a relational problem. And you know what happened. Those guys tore a hole in that roof. Yes. These guys are not afraid of going to jail for the night. They're not afraid of having to pay for repairs. All they know is Bubba is walking home today. And they let him down. I'd have to study this to be sure, but I think in the Greek, let means dropped. I don't know that for sure. Don't quote me on that. But I want you to notice, remember what the Bible said. Jesus saw their faith. He saw faith. He saw their faith. And I don't know if there includes the brother laying on the mat or not, but he saw faith. How do you see faith? It just tore a hole in the roof. What did that? Faith did that. Faith tore a hole in the roof. And remember what happened? He told that man, get up and walk. Get up and walk. You see, even in the ministry of the disciples and the apostles, Peter and John, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, were going into the temple to pray. And there was a man who had been laid there who was lame from his mother's womb. That's all your life long. And you know what you find out about him when you keep reading? He's over 40 years old. This is his whole life. When you're born this way and you've lived 40 years this way, it's your identity. And the Bible tells us two other things. Besides the fact that he's lame, so there's the physical weakness, it also tells us that he's carried there daily. Somebody or a group of somebodies has made it their part of their daily routine 
to go get this guy. And perhaps they love him and, you know, are willing to do it. But I want you to recognize this. That burden, that physical weakness, that burden and that yoke is spilling out over, and it's no longer just a physical thing. Now it's a relational thing. And this burden that he has is now a burden that other people are carrying. And not only that, but the Bible tells us he sits at that gate every day begging for alms. So this is not just a physical weakness. It's not just a relational burden now. What else is it? It's financial. This is a financial burden. When the weakness spills over into every other area of your life, it's your identity. And when it's constantly coming out of your mouth, constantly talking about what somebody's done, how somebody's hurt you, do you want to be made well? The answer is yes. But if what's coming out of your mouth is why you can't and it's because of somebody else, because of what they've done or they haven't done for you, you're not serious about being well. That's your identity. And you like it. And you want to stay that way. But somebody who's serious about getting well, somebody who's serious about being whole, begins right here. I'm not looking to anybody else. I'm not blaming anybody else for why I'm sick or weak or hurt. And I'm not looking to anybody else for my healing or my wholeness. I'll tell you one of the really twisted things about this. And you see it often. I realize people get hurt. I realize people have hurts in life. And so much of it comes from the hands of other people or the words of other people. I, I'm not denying that. I know that it happens. But the really twisted thing about it is that people who constantly blame another person for their hurt are also looking to that same person to heal them. How's that going to work? You hurt me, now heal me. Uh, is it just me? Is that weird? That's weird, right? It's so twisted. It's so demonic. And I realize people have been hurt. I realize people have been hurt by family. I realize people have been hurt by other individuals in their lives, even by religious people or, or, or so-called spiritual people. I know that it happens. But if you are serious about your identity in Christ, if you are serious about living complete, about being whole, about being made well, you will stop blaming somebody else and stop expecting them to heal you. Am I being too rough? Is this what Jesus said? Are you serious? Are you really serious about being well? First thing you'll do if you're serious is stop blaming. But notice what else Jesus said to him. Rise, take up your mat, and walk. If you're serious about being whole, about being complete, you'll stop blaming other people, and you'll get up. You'll get up. You will rise up. And, not, and, and refuse to be beat down anymore and refuse to be on the ground any longer and refuse to be identified as low and, and defeated and you will get up. And then what else will you do? You'll walk. You'll walk. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. And that's exactly what this guy did. You'd have to kind of dig and look closely, maybe with a magnifying glass to find faith out of this guy, but there it is right there. Jesus told him to get up and take up his mat and walk, and he did it. That took faith. That took faith. But here's what I want you to see. In chapter 7, this is on the heels of what just happened. In chapter 7, verse 23, John 7, 23, the, the religious people are are fighting with Jesus because this miracle took place on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them in the last part of this verse, are you angry with me? He said, are you angry at me? Look at it in the King James. Can we put that up there? I want you to see this. Are you angry at me? Because I've made a man, now listen to this, this phrase, every whit whole. 
are you angry with me because I made a man every whit whole? Has anybody used this expression in the last hundred years? <laughs> every whit, every whit? What does this mean, every whit? Well, one translation, the New King James says it like this. Are you angry with me because I made a man are you, are you looking? Yes. Completely well. Every wit whole means completely well. This phrase, every wit, in the Greek language, it means whole in extent, amount, time, or degree. Now, if you were to just look this up in the old Webster's Dictionary, wit means the smallest part or particle imaginable. The smallest part, the smallest particle that you can imagine. And Jesus said, are you angry with me? Because I made this man whole down to the smallest part, down to the smallest particle. Help me say this, Lord. I think what Jesus did for that man went so far beyond physical. Why do I think that? Because Jesus said he didn't just make him whole physically. He made him every whit whole. Down to the smallest part. Down to the smallest particle. In other words, our healing... Our completeness, when there's something physically weak, something physically missing, our God's so good and our Jesus is so good that when he heals you, he doesn't just heal that physical thing, he heals every other part of your life that it's spilled over into. He made this man every whit whole. Now, I imagine when he said, rise, take up your mat and walk, and the power of God hit that man's body, and he got up for the first time in 38 years, and he began to walk for the first time in 38 years. I guarantee you this, the thing that's going over and over and over in his mind is, I can walk, I can walk, I can walk, I can walk, I can walk. And what he doesn't realize, though, is that, yeah, and now your relationships are being healed. And now everything that you've lacked financially and everything that you've lacked emotionally in every other area of your life because of this mess, now that this is taken care of, you can be healed in every area. You can be complete. You can be whole in every area of your life. Glory to God. I don't know if the man at the gate, a beautiful, realized that. In the name of Jesus, Peter said, rise and walk. And he went walking, leaping, praising God. What's he saying? I can walk, I can walk, I can walk. And what probably hit him, I don't know, sometime later is, I'm not a beggar. I'm not a beggar anymore. I'm not a beggar anymore. And when whoever's turn it was to carry him to the temple the next day came knocking on the front door, and this guy came walking to the door, opened it up, what was the response then like? Brother, I love you, but what can I do to bless you? I don't need your strength to carry me anymore. What happened? I've been made whole. I'm complete. I'm complete. The Bible says in the book of 1 Thessalonians, let me put this on the screen for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Now may the God of peace, somebody say peace, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. The King James Bible says wholly, not H-O-L-Y, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly. May the God of peace sanctify you completely, wholly. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body, or you could say your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what God has done in us spiritually by raising us from the dead with Jesus 
it wasn't just supposed to live in a spiritual realm. When he changed your identity in the realm, in the world of the spirit, what took place in you there is supposed to now overflow. Didn't Jesus say, I came that you'd have life and have it how? More abundantly. That means overflow, overflow, overflow. Into what? Out of the spirit, overflow into the soul. Out of the soul, into the body. May the God of peace, he said, sanctify you completely, wholly. And may your whole spirit and your whole soul and your whole body be preserved. This is our identity. Your identity is whatever affects every area of your life. If your identity is wrapped up in the family you were born into, then everything in your life, you see it through that. You see every relationship through that. You see uh, your financial situation through that. How do people see their financial situation through their family? Well, if they're born into a family that's got money and they ain't got none, then they go to the family, right? They call mom, they call dad, they call papa. We've talked about this before. If your identity is wrapped up in your nationality, if it's wrapped up in your political stances, then everything in your life is affected by that. You see everything, every relationship through that. Every word coming out of your mouth is filtered through that. And this is so relevant to who and where we are right now in this world where it just seems like the political drama is ratcheted up way past 10. And everybody online, everybody on Facebook is a political expert. And they all want to tell you what they think and what they know and and what it should be and who should do what. And and it's almost as though people have forgotten that who they are in Jesus comes way before any of that stuff. Who you are in Jesus is more important than who you are as a member of your family. Who you are in Jesus is way more important than who you are as a citizen of this country or any other. Thank you, Lord. Look at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, um, you see where Jesus, he had gotten in the boat, he'd gone to the other side, and, and he was met there by a man possessed with demons. Talk about an identity crisis, my gosh. But this man gets set free. He gets set in his right mind. Jesus comes back to the other side. He crossed over again, verse 21, by boat to the other side. A great multitude gathered to him. He was by the sea. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. When he saw him, he fell at his feet. Verse 23, begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. That word translated healed is the exact same word translated healed whole. Lay your hands on her, she'll be whole. It's also, I believe, the word translated saved. Do you know the word that we use to talk about our salvation? When you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you are saved, that word, sozo, is the exact same word translated healed. And it's the exact same word translated whole. So when you say, I'm saved, what you're actually saying is, I'm complete. We use it as a term, as some sort of identification, and that's fine. You know, are you saved? Oh, he's saved. 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 Oh, you mean he's complete? Well, why is that important? Because nobody else is. Anybody outside of Jesus? You would say they're not saved? Well, what else could you say? Incomplete. They're missing something. And Jairus is asking Jesus to come lay his hands on his daughter because she's missing some strength. She's missing some life. And he says, when you lay your hands on her, she'll be healed, she'll be whole. Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him and a certain woman had a flow of blood for how long? 12 years. Here is another sickness, weakness that's been in somebody's life for so long that it becomes their identity. And not only, gosh, how do you even say this? I know it's her identity because of all the ceremonial laws attached 
to her condition. This is not just a weakness that she has to put up with. There are literally laws that prohibit her, check this out, from being around people, from being in society, for being a member of a community. So this physical weakness is now affecting what? Relationships. It's affecting friendships, relationships in the home, outside the home. And when it's in your life for over a decade and you deal with this thing day in, day out, and every day it's in front of you and every day you face it, the greatest temptation anybody like that will ever face is to try to somehow see themselves as not sick, as not weak. And when you deal with this stuff, day after day, year after year, it becomes such a part of your identity. And now, it's affecting other parts of her life. 12 years. It says though, Verse 25, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. Suffered many things from many physicians. For 12 years, doctors have been trying stuff. For 12 years, they've been experimenting on her. For 12 years, doctors have been saying, well, we're not quite sure, let's try this and let's try that. And you don't got to go back, but what, a hundred years or so. And some things that were common medical practice in our own country, you and I would step back and go, they did what to who? The stuff they put people through and the, the chemicals they put in them. I can only imagine what they were trying 2,000 years ago. Experimenting on her like a rat in a lab. She suffered many things from many physicians. Notice this now. Spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So now this physical thing that became a relational burden has turned into what? A financial burden. Spent everything she had. And at the end of the day was no better, but worse. But I love it. You ready for this? Verse 27. When she heard about Jesus. Help me out, church. How does faith come? By hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Study that verse for yourself in Romans. But it literally means hearing the anointed word from the lips of the Messiah. How does faith come? It comes when you hear who Jesus is. Faith comes when you hear what Jesus has done for you. Faith comes when you find out what Jesus wants to do for you. Faith comes when you find out who you are in him and who he is in you. Faith comes. And the, she's not reading verses. She doesn't have a New Testament. She's, she can't quote 1 Peter 2, 24. She doesn't even know that there is a first Peter. And if there's a first one, does that mean there's a second one? She doesn't know any of this stuff. This is not a Bible scholar. All she knows is what? Jesus is here. Jesus is here. So I don't know if she shut up in her house, but Jesus comes to town and the noise begins to spread and people everywhere are talking about the healers here, the healers here, the healers here, the healers here. And she hears about it. That's all we know she heard. But there was enough faith that came so that she, when she heard, she came behind him in the crowd, touched his garment, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. You know what the King James says? I shall be made. If I can get a hold of him, I'll be complete. If I can just touch, check this out. If I can touch his completeness, I can be complete. My completeness comes when I lay hold of his completeness. My wholeness comes as I touch his entirety, his wholeness. Are you following me? And she said this. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. 
And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her in verse 34, listen to it from the King James Bible. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has done what? What does faith have the power to do? Listen, come on, you got to catch this today. What does faith do? I know we talk faith and we're people of faith and we shout faith, but what's it do? What's it for? What does faith do? Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole, complete. Your faith has made thee whole. Go in peace, he said, and be whole of thy plague. Two times in one verse, what's he say to her? Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole. I thought she was. Two different words. He said, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace and be complete. Complete. Uh, what, what? She's healed. That's what she came for, right? Healed physically. That, that issue she had, it stopped. It, she felt it in her body. She's healed. She had no idea. The man at the pool of Bethesda had no idea. The man at the gate beautiful had no idea that what Jesus had done for them not only healed them physically, but made them every whit whole. Down to the smallest part, the smallest imaginable particle, what's happening? What she doesn't know is everything she lost relationally is right now being restored to her. Everything she lost financially is right now being restored to her. This is completeness. This is wholeness. How do I know that? Because Jesus said to her, go in peace. Peace. You want to know what the word peace means? Shalom. It literally means nothing missing. Nothing broken. That would be a wonderful thing. If you were sick for 12 years and then you weren't sick anymore. That would be plenty to be thankful for, right? But he said, go in peace with nothing missing, with nothing broken. In every way that this sickness and weakness has tried to become your identity, Jesus, the healer, is changing it. If it has affected you relationally, go in peace. If it has affected you physically, go in peace peace and be whole be complete guys go ahead the Bible says in the book of Isaiah and I'll give you this last verse in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 it says you will keep him are you ready for this in perfect peace have you heard anything about the word perfect in the last eight or nine weeks or so this is what we're building our hope on this year, that the God of all grace is working in us, perfecting us. And he said in that verse that you will keep him in perfect peace, complete peace. Him whose mind is stayed on you. You will keep him in perfect peace, complete peace, whole peace. So that tells me there's a difference. There's different kinds of peace. There's perfect peace and there's imperfect, partial peace. And Jesus even identified this it, it, just moments before the cross when he told his disciples, I'm leaving, but my peace I'll leave with you. And my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Oh, it's a different kind of peace. It's a perfect peace. It is peace in every area of your life. We so often think of peace as that inner tranquility, peace of heart, not, not agitated on the inside, and that's good, that's right. 
But remember what 1 Thessalonians said, may the God of all peace sanctify you wholly, completely, spirit, soul, and body. What is perfect peace? It's peace physically. Well, it starts as peace spiritually. And it overflows as peace in your heart, peace in your mind. Perfect peace is not laying in bed awake for hours on end, worried about finances, worried about relationships, worried about the job, worried about the kids. This is, this is, you're missing something. You hear me? You're missing something. What is it you're missing? Peace, wholeness, completeness. And Jesus has said to us, my peace I give to you, not like the world gives. What kind of peace does the world give? You can have peace if you have this or if you have that. You can have peace, but not if you're missing this, not if you're missing that. You can have peace if you had a little more money. You can have peace if you had a little better place to live. You can have peace if you had a little nicer something to drive. You can have peace if you had, if you had more people acknowledging you and applauding you and approving of you. You could have peace then. This is not perfect peace. Perfect peace is peace right now. Spirit, soul, and body. And he said, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. So evidently, if you're missing peace, it's because your mind's wandering. It's because you've let your mind wander to something off of him, right? And I know it's easy to do, but this is what we've got the Holy Spirit in us for, to bring our mind into subjection. Your mind is your mind. You can think on what you choose to think on. Your mind doesn't have to be driven around. You don't have to be tossed up and down, back and forth like the waves of the sea. You can be constant. You can be consistent. And with your mind stayed on him, you can live in not just peace, perfect peace. Amen? I want you to say this out loud after me. Say, perfect peace belongs to me. Healing, Healing. wholeness, wholeness. Wellness. wellness, completeness, completeness. In, every in every area of my life, in my spirit, in my, spirit. In my, soul. In my soul, my mind, my, mind. my will, will. My, emotions. my emotions, wholeness, wholeness. In, my in my body, physically, physically. Perfect, peace perfect peace belongs to me. Belongs to me. I am not just a broken person. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. He was broken so I could be whole. He was wounded so I could be healed. The chastisement needful to obtain my peace was upon him and by his stripes I am healed. By his stripes, I am whole. By his stripes, I am complete in Jesus' name. In every area, relationally, financially, physically, whatever the enemy has stolen from me is being returned right now. In Jesus' name, I claim it, I lay hold of it, I am complete in Christ Jesus. I'm in Him, He's in me, this is my identity, this is who I am, complete in Christ, strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, purchased bought, paid for with a high price. I am not my own. I belong to him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Altar ministers, would you come, please? If there's anybody in this church this morning that needs prayer for anything along these lines, if there's been any incompleteness because of a, a physical weakness or, a, or something in your own heart, the brokenheartedness, that's what it is. It's brokenheartedness. Jesus was and is anointed to heal the broken heart. And if a heart was broken and it's been unbroken, then now it's whole. It's complete. It's put back together. If there's somebody in here this morning, you've been suffering with that and it's become your identity, leave healed today. Leave whole today, strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. If you need prayer for anything this morning, this altar is open to you. You can come pray with any of these ministers or you can just come pray and praise and worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in this church. We bless you. We worship you. Every hand lifted up. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for wholeness. Peace and wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing broken. Thank you, Lord. And if you're serious, listen, church, right there, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're serious, and I mean serious, if you're done playing games and you're serious about being well, you're serious about being healed and whole, you'll stop blaming You'll stop finding fault with anybody, even if, yes, they did hurt you. You'll take your eyes off of them. Get your eyes on Jesus. They, that person can't help you. That person can't heal you anyway. Get your eyes on Jesus right now, right now, right now. Eyes on Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you're serious about being well, you'll, you'll rise up today. Today is the day you rise up. Today is the day you get up. No more laying down in the dirt. No more being defeated. You get up today. You get up today. And if you're serious about being well, you will walk out of this place in faith. You will walk out of this place in victory. You will walk out of this place today knowing who you are in Jesus and who he is in you. And you are whole in him. Complete in the name of of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, shout to the Lord if you believe any of this today. We thank you for it, Father. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Father, we love you. We worship you. We're so grateful for what you're doing in our lives and the greater things that are yet to come. We declare over this body of believers today that all this week they'll be led by your spirit, they'll be helped and strengthened by your grace, and they will be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing with the right people in Jesus' name. Church, we love you today. We bless you. If you need prayer, come to the altar, and we will see you Wednesday night for prayer. God bless you. Let's sing. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY and any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the House of Faith.